Professor, how are you? Nice to see you. Hey, folks. Who are some of the most diabolical mass murderers of this century? Think now. Charles Manson? He's accused of killing about six people. Son of Sam? He's accused of, uh, well, about six, too. Or, or John Wayne Gacy? Murdered at least 33 young guys. Well, tonight you're going to hear the case of a man currently on death row responsible for the murder of more than one million people. He's said to have relished in torture, such as cutting off women's breasts, bashing in the heads of babies. We're going to meet family members of the man accused of being Ivan the Terrible and debate tonight whether this guy deserves to be hung by the you-know-what or whether the authorities have the wrong man. Tonight, Ivan the Terrible or a terrible mistake. Stay with us. Welcome our, you welcome our home base guest, Zip It. You welcome our home base guest tonight. We've got Ed Nisnik, son-in-law of convicted Nazi war criminal. Ivan, uh, I should say, uh, John Dominyuk, a.k.a. Ivan the Terrible. And also an old friend of mine, Professor Alan Dershowitz, uh, the Harvard University Law School. Let me start with you, Ed. And, and let me start first by saying, I followed this case from its inception. I've known Ed Nisnik for four years. I knew his wife and his sister-in-law for five years. I followed this case when it was in the courts, initially in the civil courts in Cleveland, when they were stripping John Demunich, a auto worker in Cleveland, steel worker, of his citizenship, a man who was Ukrainian in background. And frankly, during that period of time that I followed this case, I honestly felt Ivan the Terrible was not John Demunich. I also felt that the evidence, the preponderance of evidence that was used against him was indeed perhaps false or doctored evidence. I did not go to Israel for the trial, although I was, at the time, one of the few who suggested maybe the only place a fair trial would be granted was in Israel. Let me start with you, Ed. Your father-in-law is accused of being one of the most evil, inhumane, cold-blooded killers of this or any other century responsible for over a million murders, and I want to get into that with you because this number seems to be growing all the time. Is your father-in-law Ivan the Terrible? No, he's not Ivan the Terrible. If under... he were Ivan the Terrible, what would you want to do with him? I, if, if John Diminuke was Ivan the Terrible, and I believed it for one second, I would hang him myself. I have no sympathy for the man that would murder an innocent blood, 900,000 innocent Jews. No Why do you say 900,000? Because I now get the figure of one million. Well, we started, uh, the court had concluded that he was responsible for killing 900,000, and uh, this is the figure that I've, that I've grown to know. Okay. Well, let me come to Professor Dishwitz. Do you believe, beyond a reasonable doubt, Professor, that John Diminuk is indeed one of the worst Nazi war criminals to emerge from the Second World War and is Ivan the Terrible? Let me start just by saying one thing to Ed. Even if I, if I believe, and we'll get to the evidence on this, that your father-in-law was uh, Ivan the Terrible, I would be unalterably opposed to his execution. I'm against the death penalty for everybody and anybody, no matter who they are. And uh, I will do everything in my power to prevent the execution of your father-in-law. But I believe to the depths of my heart and the depths of my intelligence, and it's hard to say this to a gentleman who I'm sitting right next to, I believe that your father-in-law was a, a Nazi war criminal and a mass murder. I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know how many there were. Um, but the evidence is just absolutely overwhelming. The evidence consists not only of eyewitness testimony, of people who serendipitously identified him. That is, they weren't looking for Ivan the Terrible. They were looking for somebody else. They were shown an array of pictures to see whether a guy named Fedorenko, a guard, a minor guard, uh, was there. And they said, several of them, yeah, yeah, that's Fedorenko. By the way, that's Ivan the Terrible the man who was at Treblinka, and the pe person showing them the ID said, no, 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 you misunderstand, that man was at Sorbibor. And these eyewitnesses who every day watched Ivan the Terrible butcher and kill and slaughter people said, no, 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 that's Ivan the Terrible, not even ask for I'd that. Like well, let me come back. Then, no, I, I, like I, I want to keep this that. going in my flow, Ed. I want this to keep going in my flow, all right? I'm going to ask you a question. Eyewitnesses at those camps, all right? Yes. 
have some 40 years later identified pictures of uh, Mr. Domenico, because I have been terrible, as we've just heard. Do you feel that the people were reliable? No. Why? Uh, I don't believe that the people reliable that identified John. First Why? of all, there was five, or there was actually seven people who identified him as this Ivan the Terrible. There were 40 non-identifiers of Treblinka survivors who saw Mr. Uh, this picture, alleged to be Mr. Dimenyukin, and, and I'd like to speak on the photo spread. The photo spread itself is in the, 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 the room here. Uh, I'm sure they could bring it up on the camera. Bring me my monitor out to our studio audience and see this. The folks at home will see it right and away. Let's talk about this let's photo spread. Let's see this spread. photo spread because this I have This is the photo spread that Mr. Dershowitz had been referring to. This photo spread, as, as you can clearly right, can see. You spin around there so you can see that, Ed. You see the photo spread? No. I'll walk over towards you. Bring this monitor out here a little bit further, please. Okay, I see it. Let me walk over so you can see this. Up at the top here, gentlemen. Let me go okay. up to photo what's identified as photo number 10. Okay, the picture of Mr. Diminuk is um, on the very bottom, the largest picture on the entire photo spread. That would be this picture the, here. The uh, identification, or what the survivors were looking for, that was the picture, Mort, you had your finger on. The yeah, bring me that looking. back, please, from still storage. Bring me, float that right back in here. Okay, the this survivors... This is Diminuk. Right, the survivors looking for Yvonne the Terrible were looking for a man with a thick neck, light hair and balding. No, but they weren't looking for Ivan and they're only they were looking for Federenko. They, they were, were looking for Federenko at this point. They were investigating Federenko for being in Treblinka. Fedor Federenko, who was pictured right next to Mr. Diminuk. Mm -hmm. We had an experimental <coughs> psychologist from the University of Leiden who ran the exact test on people who knew nothing about Treblinka and said, pick out the guilty man giving the same description as was that of Ivan the Terrible. 100% of the students picked that photograph out. Now, he ran a similar test well, with 25 people on a non-suggestive photo spread. And on this non-suggestive photo spread, 18% had picked him out. And I'd also like to add that that is the same photo spread that was thrown out of the same Fedorenko case in Florida. And Fedorenko was identified by this. The findings of fact of the court well, well, stood. Let me go to Professor here. Yeah. How can a substantial portion, all right, of the, uh, the prosecution's case be based on testimony of elderly people trying to identify a face which they haven't seen for over 40 years and which when they did see it was 40 years younger. That's not the fact. What happened is this. It began in the early 1970s and in the early 1970s they were shown pictures that were taken in 1950 or 51 which was only eight or nine years after. So in other words it was as if you went to high school with somebody and had seen them every single day of the week and then Ten years after you finished high school, you were shown a picture of that person ten years later. Uh, and it's not somebody you just saw in the, in the quickness of a bank robbery. Some of the people who identified him, for example, a Nazi SS guard, who certainly has nothing good to say about Jews, a man named Horn who worked side by side with him and was as anti-Jewish and anti-Israel as you can get, identified him. And well, uh, speaking uh, of that same Nazi man, Otto Horn, Otto Horn gave a sworn deposition to the United States government when he was shown the photo spread, that exact photo spread. There were eight pictures. He picked out the largest picture because he remembered Ivan as being a very large man. This is in a sworn deposition taken from Germany. This same but Nazi Butcher. Was, that, was this, that testimony allowed in your court case? Uh, in, in the, the state of Israel, the document was submitted. Otto Horn and so was the con and so was the contrary of it. Otto Wait Horn, a second, if you're going to get to, if you want to talk, Otto, you come to the loudmouth. Otto Horn's first description of Ivan the Gro oh, Ivan Grossi that was that Otto Horn. I'll come to you in a second. Otto Horn's court, first description. Let me finish and hear one talking at a time. Read my lips, pal. That's Otto all. Horn's first description, which was believed by the court, his first description of Ivan Grossi was that he was a man that was short, with a, uh, no, tall, staunch, and corpulent, with black hair, with black hair unlike the picture that he finally right, had. Now, now I might also add channel. that well, we can't Warren, ramble all day. The same they, did they, submit that, they did submit that affidavit, as you know well, and the court, when they interviewed Horn in Berlin, they, the ju three judges traveled from Israel to Berlin to interview him. And they, he said, I was given this document in English. I signed it. I didn't know what it said, and I stick with what I said that I picked out of this photo spread the Ivan I knew at Treblinka. All right, our, our guest now is Tom, all right? Tom, I think you pronounce that Schultz, is that correct? All right, Tom is the author of uh, a book called Final Justice, Israel versus But you know, the, the eyewitness testimony to my... I went to Israel. I shared some of your skepticism. When I first heard, every time I hear about a case based only on eyewitness testimony, 
I get worried because I know I've been in cases where eyewitness testimony has created mistakes. Mm -hmm. I went to Israel, I know with an open mind and with a degree of skepticism because I was one who also wrote to the Israeli authorities asking them not to execute Eichmann, who clearly was a butcher of millions and millions of people. But when I went there and I heard the overwhelming evidence, not only the eyewitness testimony, not only the identification card, not only the picture, not only a scar, a blood-type scar, in the identical spot where the SS tattooed people, which he erased because he was embarrassed it and It wasn't on his elbow, and the, 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 the blood group tattoo uh, is, should have been used as an alibi. I, I, I'd like to say this. Fedor Fedorenko, the convicted Treblinka guard that was executed in the Soviet Union, bore no blood group tattoo. Well, not everybody not had one, tattoo. Not one but convicted every... death camp guard, and I'd like you to produce the names of any that have, had the tattoo that was non-German. You're making a logical mistake. It's not that every guard had the tattoo. It's everybody who had the tattoo was a guard. In the and Waffen that, SS. He, that's right. And he erased that tattoo. And he had no excuse for erasing the tattoo. But the one main of the thing things, is, Alan, is one of the he things, convicted himself out of his own <coughs> mouth. One of the things that got to me when I was following the initial mm -hmm. steps of this trial was when the identification card came over from the Soviet Boy, Union I, that, to that, the OSI, that, you know, that, lit a red that, light was, on that was a red flag to you, and I Absolutely. talked to you about this, Ed. Yes. I looked at that, and I realized that the Germans were impeccable with their records. Yep. Impeccable. And yet here I saw for the first time an ID card that was unsimilar to anything else of ID cards I've seen you were right to be skeptical, and then you know what happened? There have now been three additional ID cards which were brought in as surprise documentation for the yeah, end the of Russians, the trial. Armin Arm Hammer. Hammer hand delivered them. Arm and Hammer, thing, a close friend of the Soviet oh, Union. Oh, let me tell you, I have, I have been more opposed to the Soviet Union and their legal system. You know, I represented Natan Sharansky and others. Nothing the Soviets ever do would be convincing to me. Let me tell you, though, what was on that ID card. There was, in the ID card, an indication that there was a scar on the back of Ivan, the, the man who was identified in that. Now, Demyanya got a scar right there uh, in the early 1940s and then had surgery and the scar was obliterated. In Soviet hospital. Wait a minute. In much, Soviet no, hospital. What is it? Let me hear my point. First. The point is, there's no way, no way the Soviet authorities, no matter how brilliantly forging they could be, that they would know well, about so that on, scar. He was in between... Soviet hospital. He was a captured, he was a captured German, uh, POW by, uh, by the Germans, but when he was a Red Army soldier, he was wounded. And when the Red Army paid his mother a hero's pension until 1960, the Red Army went through her house, you're, pulled out all the evidence. They knew clearly that he had had a scar you're, on his back from Soviet war records. You're stating a story that is, you know, he, his defense was, I was in Chelm as a prisoner of war. I was not in Sobibor. I was, I was totally innocent. Now, to believe, and let's say ID. this ID. Move, that, move that monitor around. Way, I want our audience to see a picture of this ID. And the reason I questioned this ID initially was, and I don't know if I can read this from this uh, far away. Let me see the ID card. All right. This is uh, Ivan the Terrible. All right. When I looked at that ID card originally, and incidentally, we never had a true copy of that ID card in the United States. It was in Israel, though. It was in Israel, yeah. all right? Yeah. But it was never allowed in the United States. It was. It was not tested in the United States. Never tested here, though. Never alone, tested here. You don't know anything. It was no, never it wasn't. forensically it was. tested in here. Never it was forensically alone. tested. This the card was looked at. The, the original came, yes. The original yes. was never forensically tested. And what, was tested. your defense attorney allowed to test no. it? No. Why didn't he? No, he wasn't allowed to. He was he was. Approved the judge by the judge Batiste. No, Judge Batiste. He was given the time. Quit your lying through your teeth. You know nothing. Come what on. are you sitting up here saying? You knew nothing about the case in and 1981. You know that your defense Were you in the court? Were you in the court? Were you in the court, you in the court are, gentlemen? Just a moment. Were you in the court when Batista was finding, making these decisions? I was not in so the court. So was I. I. Oh, I was. And, okay. and did his defense attorney... No, Batista was, was, was not allowed to allowed forensically... To, but here was the thing that bothered me. Ivan the terrible John Dimiuk is, I believe, six foot two. Yes, and the what card was the height on that card? Five foot nine. Five foot nine. And also, let me, let me add the most important point. As this ID card was first introduced, having nothing to do with allegations of Jimmy Nuke being in Treblinka, the card itself never places him in Treblinka. It came in a 1977 article of a man the by the name of H. Right, Daniel Let me hear that. Let Alan bring this back. Thing. Now, now, Alan bring this back. Oh, wait, that's the no, I'm the one who decided who's failing in the whole case. The proof is that he was at Sorbibor and at Trinity. 
Now, his defense was, I wasn't at Sorbibor, I wasn't at Triniki, and I wasn't at Treblinka. If he had had the decency to admit, look, I was at Sorbibor, I was there, then you wouldn't have to question the good faith of the United States government. Why you didn't the U.S. To... bury this report until 1987? When it came as a piece, they had it since yeah, 1979, Mr. Arguments. You're making Why these did technicalities. They bury this report? Which you're making the kind of technical John, arguments that more always condemns. A moment, a moment, Ed, was set and Ed, a moment, all right? Eventually a moment. Let me ask Alan yeah. question, question, Professor. Without any doubt in your mind, is Jimmy Newark Ivan the Terrible. Let is there any doubt? Let me tell you what my feeling is. Without any doubt, none, my reputation of 25 years, I would state John Demyarnik is an SS-trained killer who was at Sorbibor without any doubt. All right. I also believe he was at Treblinka. All right. I think if he had defended by saying that he was at Sorbibor and was only Ivan the Very Bad rather than Ivan the Terrible, he might have won this case. All right. But, by but he, he was, was on trial as Ivan the Terrible, not as Ivan the Very Bad. I'm saying. But we're agreeing that he could have been Ivan the Very Bad. And, but then he puts on then he puts on his defense. I was totally innocent. I was this angel at film. I never did anything wrong. Now, when he first came to the United States, they asked him where he had come from. He said, Sorbibor. He never mentioned would a film. Would man say that he was there? Would any doubt? We're going to come back to we're going to come back to John Dimmingyuk Jr., who's with us tonight. In just a minute, yes. we're going to show you exactly how easy it is to make a fraudulent ID card, precisely the way the Soviets may have done so in this case. Stay with us. show furnished by quality limousine service when in new jersey call 201-785-9071 number one to John Gill, all right? John Gill was the chief counsel for convicted Nazi war criminal, Ivan the Terrible. Now, John, question. Chief counsel for Dominion, what you have investigated is the authenticity of the ID card. What are your findings? Well, to correct one of the statements that was made earlier, with regard to the card, for example, we presented three witnesses who testified that John Dominion was not the author of the signature that appears on this training card. The state of Israel provided nobody. And in cross-examination, their own witness, who was not court-qualified till four years after he was in charge of the office, he said that he saw discrepancies but gave them no weight. And he, in fact, said there were five other people in Israel that could have had the same signature that appeared on the card. So, uh, first of all, the card, in my opinion, was not authentic. Let's go. Let's bring our monitor out here again and show the audience how you can create a false ID card. And uh, please make this available so that uh, Professor Dershowitz can see this, too. We're not just creating some scam here. Would you give me this run-through, folks? This is uh, photograph this, one. This is a photograph of William Flynn, who was a, the document examiner, one of the three that testified in Israel, and he was made famous in Israel of the white salamander case uh, involving uh, Mark Hoffman. And right. this is a picture of him. Again. Now, this is a picture of him, um, William Flynn, and you'll see that now you can't see the full uniform, but he's in, in the uniform there, and now you can see. Now, what has happened, and this is picture is identical to the, the picture that you'll see on Tough 149, or the Tronicki training card. It's whited out. And according to William Flynn, when he did this process, it eliminated the background. Now, in this case, there were three photographs that were introduced in, or attempted to be introduced into evidence. The Deminuk photograph, or the photograph that's on Tough 149, or the uh, Tronicki training card, and one other. And in those the other one, the picture was obviously misplaced and replaced because you could see the way the holes are on the card. And in, in both of those situations, the background is whited out. Now, with Point. regard to the bottom line, bottom line, the okay. bottom line is that in the process of changing the photograph from one head on top of the body of the other one, it causes an airbrushing effect and it's whited out. 
When we tried to introduce this evidence, the court said that the introduction of that photograph of William Flynn was not relevant to the trial, even though as part of our defense, we had said, and John Demenuk had testified truthfully, that although the picture looked like him, that uniform he had never been in. And so it was relevant. That it wasn't relevant. Because the question is not whether Mr. Gill or Mr. Flynn are good forgers. The question is, is that photo on the card doctored? And the beauty of a court of law is that you have to prove things. You have to prove that that picture was doctored, forged, and that's not what occurred in the court. That's why the document was held to be authentic. The why it couldn't be proven is the court never let us have full access to forensically test that card. William Flynn, Dr. Julius Grant, who proved the Hitler diary to be a forgery, asked to remove the picture off the card because ink had bled through the staple. Yes. The Israeli court said that this card, and it's such a, a treasured possession, is more important than the life of this man, and we that cannot not remove true. it. That, that is not true. Well, I just read the seven... Er, wait a second, let me hear I just... Okay. Wait a second. I just finished reading the 761-page opinion of the three judges in Israel, which is one of the most thorough. God, I wish I could get opinions like this from most American courts. The Flynn interesting thing led to a very interesting vignette. What happened there is Flynn was uh, cross-examined at one point because Flynn had said something earlier that he thought there was no problem with the ID card. And he was asked a question about it, and he said, I can't answer that question because if I am, I'm going to be sued by this man because I have a contract with him. And the contract won't allow me to answer those questions. Now, the reason for that is that the community that was paying for this really had a conflict. They weren't so interested in proving Demyanyuk's innocence or guilt. They were much more interested in having a campaign against Soviet documentation. And they didn't want to have this trial be used as a way of in any way validating Soviet documentation because there was witness after witness, including Ger German witnesses, American witnesses, non-Jewish witnesses, who came to the conclusion that this particular card was valid. They tested the years of the paper, they tested the ink, they tested a whole range of things. Everybody admits Why the Soviet that they you're, you're absolutely wrong. Off. You're absolutely wrong, because as a matter of fact, in the White Salamander case with Mark Hoffman, 10 forensic experts came in and testified that those forged documents were authentic. And Bill Flynn, through a, a, a very long process, determined that all of the documents were, in fact... Then why couldn't he answer the question? Why did he have this contract? Have you ever heard of a case? No, you're, you're, you're lawyer. Have you ever heard of a what contract? He said. I'll you're, tell you what he said, because I have the quote right mixed, here. You're mixed up on the me. point that Let you're trying to make. Here's, let's, let's, At the conference of forensic document examiners, he said, I have examined the card firsthand for three days. I have examined the thing microscopically, and there's nothing about the card that I can see that would not have passed muster. Okay, and that, in taking, it, in taking it in total context, what he said was as a result of his deep involvement in the White Salamander case, one cannot just look at a document and accept it. So he made that statement and he but, followed it up by but, saying, but what about and the therefore contract? someone has to what about investigate the contract? Whether what about the contract? 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 What happened when he came, he was cross-examined for several hours, and at the end of the day, he indicated that he did not want to go forward because of the conflict. Well, what, then what when he conflict? came into Explain court... the contract, though. Was, what kind of a conflict a or contract? He came into court the next morning, and he said that although there was a weekend coming up, he said that he wanted the advice of his own attorney as to whether he should proceed or not. He then said, and it's in the record, that if you'll allow me to go home and converse with my attorney, then I will come back and testify. That's a joke. Why did he need to converse with his attorney? attorney. Why, why did he need to converse with his attorney, Mr. Gill, if he already knew the answer that he would come back and testify? Why didn't he just testify? Because... Why didn't he just testify? It's, it's a guilty man's argument. He, he, you don't hide behind contracts if you tell okay, the truth. Okay, I'll tell you what. Next, we'll see how this case has brought simmering hatred between two ethnic groups and very, very much of it is coming to the surface. Stand by.
before I go, before I introduce you to our additional guests, let me first come back to Professor Dershowitz. We hear about this case and we say, oh, God, it's just another case. I mean, you know, we become so blasé. And we say, oh, it's another case of someone else who killed 900,000 Jews. But how about the horror of some of his crimes? Alan, enumerate some of those crimes. I mean, 900,000, he probably stood there while 800,000 of them went into the gas chambers. Well, right? there's he no personally didn't put them here in the there's gas there's no chamber. dispute. What about some of the others? Yeah, here there's no dispute. And we have to give a lot of credit, it seems to me, to the people on the other side, because they are not Holocaust deniers. Some of their friends have come from Holocaust deniers, but they're not Holocaust deniers. They conceded the horrors of Ivan the Terrible, which included, first of all, being the man who ran the actual machine in which thousands and thousands of people were just brought into these gas chambers. They were pushed in. The gas chambers were sealed. Ivan the Terrible beat them with chains, cut off the breasts of women going in. In one case, after the gas chambers, I can hardly say this, after the gas chambers were open, a young 15-year-old girl was still alive, and he ordered a Jewish guard to pull his pants down and have sex in front of him with this 14-year-old girl, and then he shot the girl and he shot the guard. In another case, he ordered a witness to have sex with a corpse. I mean, this man was a pervert, a There's disgusting, no question about Ivan's terrible man. deeds. The only issue here this evening on this show is that Mr. Diminuk is not this monster, Ivan the Terrible. There's no doubt about it. Let me introduce, let me introduce. The fellow that was supposed to have done this testified in court, so he wasn't shot in the head. This only goes to show how in this instance, because of the emotional involvement, no, 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 you, and because... Now you're confusing. There are two cases. One Julia involving Rosenberg, Rosenberg the one that said no, that this happened to him when he was protected now, by a German guard. I said the first case of the 14-year-old girl, the 14-year-old girl, both she was shot and the man who had sex with her was shot. The Rosenberg case with the corpse, he was still alive. So I'm not incorrect about that. Well, let me introduce some other opinion. folks here, all right? We've got Mordecai Levy, who is with the Jewish Defense Organization. Mordecai, I understand that you are convinced the Minyak is guilty, all right? But you have even greater concerns about some of those who are backing his defense. Who do you think is supporting his acquittal? There's no question, because pictures speak louder than lying words, that neo-Nazi, and I have a picture here of them having a Demyonyuk freedom rally, carrying signs, six million lies. This was in Cleveland. I was there. And Holocaust is a hoax. I never saw that. Here's the picture. I never we saw We took pictures of the Ukrainian National Committee that was at that rally. Oh, wait a second. Now, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Zip it. Let me ask you a question, Mordecai. If outside this studio right now were a bunch of radical carrying signs that said the Holocaust never happened, all right, Holocaust a hoax, would I now be indicted as scum who allowed this type of thing? In other words, how can we say Demunich did this and it wasn't just some of the people who are radical who did it? On supposedly on his behalf. In the White Power paper, called it's called White Power, out of, out of Arlington, Virginia, that ran the bank account number to deposit account on behalf of the family for the defense fund. I've never fund. seen such trash. Well, you better read it. 19... I don't read such trash. You might waste it. your well, time reading it. Well, how about the fact that I don't read such in Cleveland garbage. met with the neo-Nazi leader, Casey Kalemba, at 43 I never 19 heard of the man. Clark I Avenue. Avenue. You I don't never heard of the hear man. Of them. Here's the picture. I don't associate myself with such did any of the you community? Did any of your community? No. I have some eyewitness. Let me hear. Let me hear Professor Dershowitz. I have let some eyewitness testimony. I have some eyewitness testimony. Different. At the trial, I confronted John Demyanyuk Jr. in the hallway, and I asked him the following question on the day of the verdict. I said, "I have a quote from you from a a AP, and I have witnesses, and I have the exact words. I have a quote from you from AP, quoting Jerry Brendar, who was one of the fundraisers for the Demyanyuk Fund, saying." The Jews who are crucifying this man, Demyanyuk, will suffer the same fate as the Jews who have rightfully suffered the fate for crucifying our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait and I asked him the question, are you prepared to disassociate yourself from that statement? And he was unwilling to disassociate himself from that statement. John Being Jr. unwilling to do that means Jr., you're complicit. Is that, is that a true and accurate account of what happened? That's not an accurate, that's, that's, accurate. that's uh, absolutely not I an accurate account of what happened. I've never known Professor Dershowitz to lie. Is it possible? that in the emotion of that moment, of your father being convicted when you truly in your heart believed him innocent, that you could have made a statement such as that? I did not condone that statement. I simply said that I had nothing to do with it, and I had no comment, because at that point, I have never heard of such a statement. 
I this showed it to you. Here's what happened. I showed you the statement. What'd you show me? I showed you the AP report of the statement. I said, this is a man who said he is a fundraiser and a travel agent for the Demyanya campaign. Are you prepared to disassociate yourself from that statement? Oh, in you other words, no. John didn't make the statement. No, no, no. Man. I'm saying Mr. Oh. Brendar made the statement. Brendar being the man who was dismissed from a campaign recently? Recently, but he also is a Holocaust denier. He is also somebody who has made uh, allegations about Jews killing Christ, that kind of thing. And he was claiming to speak on behalf of the Dumyanya campaign. It was only fair for the Dumyanya family to say at that point, as it is now, to say right now that you totally and completely and unequivocally disassociate yourself from Jerry Brendar, from anybody in who would the make Ukrainian that type community of a or any other community who would make that kind of a Do statement. Do you John yes or no? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Uh, let me, uh, let let me, me tell you something. We, we had a... I'd like to add this. I had sent a letter, and that is a, it's a very, it's a very, I guess, a emotional type of a statement for some people who aren't thinking too clearly. However, I sent a letter to your show, to Andy Regal, of a letter written by a Treblinka survivor who lives in New York by the name of Franz Stiffel. And the last lines of his letter say, please do not say the word for which the Jewish people have suffered for the past 2,000 years, ecce homo. I don't know that Jimmy Nuke is the man. Are you sure that you do? This was from a Treblinka survivor who saw his parents killed. Of course, remember there were thousands and thousands of people. Now, Wait a we're minute. talking about that statement. There were two Everyone camps. Of course, Wait, I would never say such thing. Well, very important to make a point about this. There were two camps. There was the, the upper and the lower camp. There were hundreds and hundreds of people who survived. One a work camp, one a death. When camp. you have a bank robbery and somebody comes into a bank and some people five identify him, automatically it means a hundred didn't identify him. Of course, there were hundreds of people at Treblinka who could not identify this man. He was identified by those who work with him on a daily basis, right. as if you went to high school. He was also identified from people from the work camp who were never in the death camp, and three out of the six people that survived the death camp, there was only six, three out of the six had given statements after Treblinka was leveled that Ivan was in fact killed. Three out of the six people and one who of them survived later changed the death the testimony, camp. One of them later who supposedly survived. Right, the man who said two times. One time he said that Ivan was killed with shovels by the other guards. I had to go to Poland personally and smuggle documents out because the archives in Poland have been locked to the defense for the past 12 years. Though they're open to the Israelis and the U.S. government, I had to smuggle a statement out where this man claimed to be an eyewitness to Ivan's death. There are an eyewitness who says, we court. killed Ivan. And we, we were limited to one page on that statement. We were limited to the death of, the of Ivan. We were not limited to only the death of Ivan. The council had 400,000 pages of documents on Treblinka sitting in Globna Comiskia, right now in Poland. And we're, we're not, not allowed in. in. Tom. What about the way? You, 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 know, you know exactly down the other parts how of you were statement. supposed to approach the Why couldn't we? You wrote and the prosecution submitted them, and you had every opportunity. We had no now, opportunity after to there's a verdict, limit it you didn't have a chance. Let me, let me straighten, straighten something out of my mind here. Let me straighten something out of my mind, maybe for our audience at home and maybe for our audience here. Ed, when I first met you, all right, you were working at a... Had Hunter. good, yeah. good had good job, all right. Yes. Uh, you didn't wear fancy clothes. No. You didn't have the beard. No. All right. Didn't have any of this stuff. You weren't the spokesman for the family. Yes. How come all of a sudden you became the spokesman for the family? All of a sudden they see uh, Mark uh, Connors, the original lawyer. When you get to Israel, he's fired. Yes. After uh, he said it was what? a fair trial, he said he, he was, it was fired a fair before trial. that. What? No, no, Mark, what happened? Why? Uh, this was a close camaraderie between the family, Mark O'Connor, uh, and all of you people. Well, what happened? He said it was a fair trial after he was fired. That's my not point. And Mark O'Connor, no, the, the point. same Mark O'Connor is the same man who told us all, John, John Gill, that the Israeli government planted a Mossad agent in our defense to make sure John would hang. His inconsistent statements speak for himself. That's again a guilty man's argument. If you have nothing to hide, I don't justify planting a Mossad agent, but even if there was one, what would he hear? He'd overhear you admitting your guilt? That's, that's, uh, we don't believe well, that's We've true. got a young lady we sitting on the, uh, true. on the home base with his patient hunt work. Uh, patients, uh, you're an attorney, I know that. Let me ask you a question. Do you see any validity in Mr. Levy's argument that the Ukrainian community consists of Nazi sympathizers and anti-Semites who approve of the hideous acts committed by Ivan the Terrible? He didn't say that, but if he, if he did say it, I would recommend that they sue him, because that's absolutely untrue. Some of them are involved, and I'll quote... Every you. single... Let's quote somebody me. else. Let's quote Dove Ben My Ear, the Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, who sent a letter to Mrs. Bozhana Osinuski saying, 
Since the days of Volkan Khmelnytsky, the Jewish people have a long score to settle with the Ukrainian people. Vendetta from the 16th century. And the hundreds of them that marched with signs, six million lies that was videotaped. Yeah. Who, Who are the people? Who are the people? Who are the people? Let me see. That, you only, tells that you. only tells you, that only tells you, Mordecai, what those Let people are. Let me see the page. Not one. Who is it? Let's see a name underneath there. Can you prove? I remember I remember these pictures. I remember these pictures. Let me see this. JDO, the pro Nazi criticism. Let's take a break while these gentlemen look at this, all right? We'll come back. Is it possible for an accused Nazi to get a fair trial in Israel and avoid the hangman's noose? We'll find out. Stand by. on the party line, and it's as close as your phone. All right, let's get right down to business. The amount of time that we have left in this show, let's get right down to business. I want to go to Patience first. Zip it, I want to get this show going again, gang. Patience, let me come to you. It sounds like in Israel, in this case, the Munich was guilty Samuel, until proven. You have to pronounce uh, don't it. Don't correct me, sweetheart. Just do your job and you'll do fine. You're not an English speaker, right? right? I've been involved in the case a lot longer than you have been. Now, let me tell you something. Okay. Do you feel that he was guilty before being proven innocent? I feel he was guilty, uh, that he was innocent, and he has not been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm here for probably the, the main reason I'm here is that Alan Dershowitz has written three articles in which he suggests that under modern jurisprudence, someone can be tried, convicted, and executed for executed? A, a fact situation. You'll never hear Dershowitz, Dershowitz talking about someone being That's executed. That's the first time I hear this tonight, Alan. I didn't Well, you didn't you, read my article. In your article, you said that you oh, were... Yeah. L.A. Times headline. Painting of uh, Ivan will not erase pain of Holocaust. Why shouldn't he be out. hung? He murdered people. Why shouldn't he? That he should not Let me be ask you something, Mordecai. Let me ask you something, Mordecai. Let me ask you something. I couldn't agree more. But if I come to you and I say, Mordecai, I have zip it up there. If I come to you and I say, I have the engineer of one of the trains that brought prisoners to Treblinka, should this guy be tried? Everybody has the right to a fair trial. I Shouldn't he be tried? That. Absolutely. Right. I have the conductor to that train. Should he be hired? Of course he should yeah. be tried. How hell yeah. far down the line are you going to go? The answer is those who have moral complicity in murder are held liable for what they've done. Those who don't play a direct role in murder are not. Wait a second. Let me ask you a question. Then what you were telling me, what you were telling me is eventually, if the Supreme Court in this country overturns abortion, the Supreme Court justices who validated abortion are guilty of murder, and they should be tried. No, I, I say this, that when people do willful no, genocide... No, you find the fine line all the way down, baby. There is, there is a line. And that... There's a difference between willful genocide, knowing genocide, and somebody who uh, didn't know what they were doing. But if somebody put people in the gas chamber, that's willful genocide. And that people have to pay a price for. Those who lynch blacks in the South, they had to pay a price. Those what about combos? Those who murder Jews in the camp, they will have to pay Topos? a price. Whether it's Martin. through our hands or those Martin. systems Let me you call American justice. Topos, I'm here to confront Alan. Topos, Sunder Commandos, Judenrat, who had to collaborate with the Nazis. The fact is... Alone. Some of those you'd not were punished by other Jews. Okay, okay. let me ask you. So you are for no, all of them. I, I, everybody who collaborates. Let me answer you. I feel that anyone who plays a hand in willful genocide, yes. intentionally, yes. knowingly, yes. whether it's uh, Subzikov in New Jersey, and he's gone, should get the death penalty. They should be given the death penalty. Let me hear patience. Okay. Okay. Let me hear patience, Ed. Listen, I went to now. the same law school as Alan Dershowitz. We both went to Yale, and I feel he should know better. I'm here to ask him how he, how he could possibly justify convicting someone on a fact situation of which he was not charged, i.e. being Ivan the Very Bad at Sobibor. Those were not the charges. Those charges were not proven 
They were investigated and discarded by the Office of Special Investigations in the late 70s. Alan Dershowitz has written three prominent We'll let Alan answer that after these commercials. and then I want Professor Dershowitz to answer you. Zip it up. Let me hear this. Go ahead. Okay. Morton, I, I am upset because I think the Ukrainian community has been criticized for doing, has been criticized for doing something that I'm about to do. Well, let me... John, let me... Here's, here's $20 for your father's defense. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry it can't be more. This is, Go ahead. this is very interesting. Let me hear, let me hear Alan. I represent people who I despise. I represent people who are guilty of crime. I don't kiss them. I don't get involved personally. I think that what you did here is disgraceful. I mean, what you're what doing is you're associating yourself not only with the defense, but as a professional, what you're doing is you're identifying yourself personally. You have just kissed the son of a mass murderer. On but that doesn't make him a mass murderer. That doesn't make him a mass murderer. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Listen. Will you at least shake hands? But Alan, Alan, this is not the mass murderer. But he kissed him. He kissed him. He kissed him. He kissed him. But he's not guilty. I understand that. Can I? As a man? As a man. But we are seeing an identification here which is wrong. Look, let me tell you. Let me hear Alan. I have represented people for 25 years. Shut up! I believe very strongly in the presumption of innocence. I started out in this case believing that Dumyarnik was innocent. I have never seen a case in 25 years with a combination of eyewitness, of documentation, of experts, of false alibi testimony, of erased scars, of historical evidence, every one of which you can discount. But the but one thing we have together, to do, Alan, I know the one thing you would agree with. The one thing you, agree with, the one thing you would agree with, and this. The one thing you'd agree with, I'm sure, is we can't allow, regardless of how simmering it may have been, the animosity of the Ukrainian community and of a Jewish community from the 16th century to allow itself today to surface as, again, Look, mass anti-Semitism or mass ethnic hate. I work and together, I work together with the Ukrainian community. I work together with patients. We both work against the evils of the Soviet Union. We are trying to bring Jews and Ukrainians out of the Soviet Union. We want Jews to be able to pray in their synagogues, Ukrainians in their church. We despise the oppression of the Soviet Union Back together. in a second, we'll find out about something different. There are thousands of children with little... Right. In the short time we have remaining, you've got 10 seconds to tell me what you just said during commercial. I would just like to make one point clear. Even the judges had acknowledged in the verdict that Mr. Dimenyuk's alibi... Zip it up, damn it! The judges had said in their own verdict that his alibi was not, refu it was re not refuted, that he's simply not telling the truth. They could not John, get a historian to, to disprove it. Let me just clear up one thing. The motives of people like Alan Ryan, who should have been here, why are these people afraid to come on and debate the issues with the defense? Bring on people sure, like Neil Chair. Let's bring them on. Bring on the people well, here's Neil Chair. Neil Chair is the Chair Procurator General Justice. of the USSR. I fear that an acquittal of them, you could arouse public sentiment in the United States to discontinue the trial against fascist criminals. All right, let me, let me like ask that. Professor Dershowitz a question. I know you stand Their against the death penalty. I work more I than am in favor of the death penalty. If Dimenyuk is Ivan the Terrible, I say cut his balls off and hang him forever, all right? Yeah. However, however, I am not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that this man is Ivan the Terrible. Would you, as a proponent of everyone having a right hey. to life, 
Would you go in and try and get his death penalty set aside? I will do everything in my power to get his death penalty set aside. I will do everything in my power to make sure the truth comes out. I don't want to create tensions between any communities. This is about one man, one horrible, brutal murderer, who, if he is not Ivan the Terrible, is a guard at Sorbibor who deliberately Let me make killed sure that that's men, what he's men. convicted of, then, friends. All right, Alan Dershowitz is the best. Alan Dershowitz has no axe to grind on either side. Let's forget, let's forget the racial tension, damn it, and get back to what's important. Alan Dershowitz, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. Let's go. Good night, everybody.